Well, good evening, guys, and welcome to our winter fireplace conversations. And uh, so good to see you guys here, and we'll be spending a few moments with uh, you and I here this evening, and uh, you can mark your corny if you like. We got the fireplace going over here on the computer. And so I was telling our church this morning, I said, I know we've been calling this uh, the fire or no, the front porch conversations for many, many months now. And so uh, here approaching this winter season, I say, you know what? I don't think I'll be out on the front porch doing this, and nor do I suggest anybody else to sit on their front porch, uh, especially here in Indiana. And so we just transitioned to the winter season and called it our fireside conversations. And so I think it'll be a blessing to you guys this evening. Pray and hope that you guys are doing well. Hope that the Lord has been blessing you guys today and you guys have had a great Lord's Day. Uh, we have had as well, especially this morning. It was so good to see everybody this morning. And we had a uh, wonderful service looking back and just remembering how so good the Lord is to us and uh, how we can be as Christians joyful for His many blessings, especially in the season of Christmas. And I pray if you haven't done that, go ahead and look back on the morning service. It'll be a blessing to you, I'm sure. But if you have your Bible uh, today, go ahead and go to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And uh, we, will be going, we will go ahead and just really talk about this for the whole chapter. Now again, if you're just now tuning in, you haven't tuned into our series in the last couple of weeks, I know I says we've been transitioning into our Sunday night services. Uh, really, what we want to see happen, we being Pastor Cody here, is that I'll be spending about 15, 20 minutes going through our Bible. Here right now, we're wrapping up Ecclesiastes, and uh, I love to probably look at some other books in the, in the nearby section of Ecclesiastes, just to kind of continue in our Sunday night devotions. And really what I would love to see for you guys to do, uh, we can necessarily not really call it small group, uh, but would love to see you guys take the devotion and apply it, maybe even talk about it right now, uh, or even set some time out in just the next 20 minutes. Uh, go ahead and apply it to your guys' evening conversations. Uh, that's why we call it conversations. That's why we called it the front porch conversation. That's why tonight we're calling it the fireside conversations because these devotions are in a way really not so much preaching with you. You and I are going to be joining and reading through chapter by chapter with the Bible uh, throughout these series, but I would love for you to take away from it and start really talking about what we've talked about because all I'm going to do is spend about 15-20 minutes of it and that would introduce some thoughts for you guys. Maybe the parents teach uh, or even kind of talked about it with the kids, or husbands talked about it with their wives, and this really the doors are open. You know, maybe maybe you're uh, by yourself this evening, and that's okay. Maybe you can kind of call a friend and talk about tonight's conversation. Maybe you can uh, uh, talk bad about the pastor. I don't know, <laughs> but really, what we like to see happen is just for you guys to talk a little bit about what we see uh, or what we're going to be seeing in the next few moments. And then really make kind of that, it's a, it's a trendy term right now, small groups, but really just take the devotion and make it a purpose to make it an evening conversation. I don't know when's the last time you've walked out of the church doors and talked about the message and said, you know what, I really got this out of the message. Um, so that's just really what we're what we're aiming for, and we'll try to we'll, we'll kind of assist you with that in the coming weeks. I'll probably uh, have some questions leaving at the end of the end of the service here, uh, end of the devotion, really, um, for maybe some startup questions for your guys' conversations. And I pray that it'll be a blessing to you. So looking forward to that. Just a couple of announcements before we get into our prayer group. Uh, if you're part of Fairbanks Missionary Baptist Church, we are going to be having a leadership team meeting next Sunday. So that will be our deacons, our trustees, our treasurers, uh, me, good Lord willing. So all of our leadership team members, we're going to be joining and talking about a few things that we need to talk about, kind of wrapping up the end of the year and looking ahead for next year of what 2021 will bring. And uh, we have a couple of topics that we're going to bring forth to the business meeting. 
And so Fairbanks Missionary Baptist Church has a business meeting quite often. So we're not going to be having it next Sunday, which is December 13th, but we will be having a short business meeting on December 20th. And we have some things that we'll be partnering with uh, contractors for church building improvements. So if you're a church member listening to this, we'd love to see you on December 20th, especially that morning service. And stay after, it'll probably only take about 15 or so minutes and uh, it'll be it'll be an encouragement to me it'll be a blessing for the church so we can decide on some good business and that way it allows the church to partner with some local contractors uh to see some church improvements being done lord willing in the next couple of months so that's all that we've had the announcements for uh from this morning into tonight and if you haven't done so this is a very special announcement probably more important than even our meetings as much as i would not like to say that but if you haven't yet done so we would love for you to prayerfully take some take some moment here and just pray over uh, giving to our missionary wives of the Fairbanks Missionary Baptist Church family. We are taking a little bit of a love offering both last week, today, and next Sunday. And uh, we're wanting to aim about $1,200, $1,300, dollars somewhere in that ballpark. We'd love to give a good, good offering to each of our missionaries that we've been supporting this year. And uh, in order to do that, we need your support. We need your guys' help. So if you have not yet prayerfully done so, would you mind considering giving a special love offering, a Christmas offering to our missionary wives? Uh, we, are, we do need it still. We're, we're not yet close to it yet, but I know we will this month. And I know we're going to be an encouragement to our missionary wives. Uh, they, many of them are out in other parts of the world. And they haven't, and they will not be able to experience the same kind of American Christmas that you and I get to enjoy today. So let's go ahead and see what the Lord will have for us in Ecclesiastes chapter six, and let's pray for His blessings upon our devotion this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we appreciate all the goodness that you have given us. Father, Lord, now as we come together in evening time and enjoy, enjoy this uh, wonderful time of devotion, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, and Lord, that you try us and that you may encourage us. Maybe, Lord, that there's a good nugget here to talk about. Maybe, some, maybe somebody will learn something about their relationship with you, Lord, or learn something about their outlook in life uh, that they maybe need correct or maybe are encouraged by tonight. So pray, Lord, that you may assist us and our families and our church and our friends and those that are connecting with us to assist them in having some good, meaningful conversations, Lord, even after this time of devotion. So, Lord, we just pray that your word be a benefit to us tonight and that the Spirit may speak through it. And not myself, but your words only, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and we will begin our fireside conversation. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Why don't you read with me and we'll begin our fireside conversation here as we read. And so here in our fireplace conversations. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun. And it is common among men a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth, and this is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with uh, good, and also that he hath no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor know anything. This hath more rest than any other. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? Why hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wondering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contendeth with him that is mightier than he. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? For who knoweth what is good, the man in this life, all the days of his vain life? 
which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So the first thing that we see here really is life's purpose and attainment. This is not the first aspect of our devotion, but it is something that we see as a title, really, if, you, if you're taking notes, a title uh, for this evening, for the chapter. We just simply call it life's purpose in attainment. And I'll be talking about that here in just the next few moments. But what we first off see in just the first few verses is a quaint saying here, and you may have heard it, uh, maybe have heard may have heard different translations of it, maybe it's different words of it. But really the first statement, the first tidbit of wisdom that old Solomon gives us is that this is as futile as watering the post. As futile as watering the post. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you have a post where you live. If you visit us here at the Parsonage in Fairbanks, you'll find that we have a really well decorated stump. And uh, I have a picture of the house many, many years ago, back in 1989, in fact, and there's this beautiful, great, beautiful pine tree uh, that probably would have been a great piece to our front yard. It would have provided a lot of shade in our beautiful front porch that we have here in the Parsonage. Uh, but for whatever reason, I think it was a bad storm, uh, our beautiful, our, that beautiful grand old pine tree had fell. And what is left is now just a uh, old, wrinkly, no good for nothing other than a swirl to eat, eat the uh, things around on it, stump. And as that saying is, as futile as it is, as worthless as it is, as pointless as it is to water a post, I, I'm reminded of this stump out in the front yard. I can do nothing to it other than either get rid of it or throw something on top of it to make it look more pretty. I can't water it. I can't add uh, I can spend a thousand dollars on miracle grow, and nothing will ever make this stuff come back. And so it's pretty worthless. And that's what Solomon is talking about here in Ecclesiastes chapter six in the first few verses, where he says, "You know what? I see something that is pretty much wrong, pretty much evil. I see something that's under the sun here in my life, here in Earth, that is really actually quite common. It is evil and common. And what he sees is a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor." So fame, good estates, and good finances, to where this man wants nothing, for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not the power to enjoy it, or to eat thereof, as the Bible says here, but rather a stranger does enjoy it, and this is vanity, this is pretty much worthless, worthless is what Solomon is saying, and quite frankly, it is an evil disease. You know, Solomon here is said that this was a common thing among men of his day. And I think as American Christians, we live in a, uh, a society, a culture, a government, a lifestyle, where this too is really a very common thing that we see. And, and please bear with me for the next few moments, as I'm not trying to say that the uh, uh, program in and of itself is wrong, or that the program in and of itself is an evil thing. But the philosophy of what's going on here is, is really the same in what we live in the 21st century. You see, Solomon saw a good, wealthy man who God had blessed his life with and gave him all the luxuries of his life. And we don't know whether this man was paralyzed, whether he was physically truly unable to enjoy the riches that he received, or that he worked so hard in establishing this wealth and establishing this beautiful home and establishing this lifestyle and giving everything that he could give in his life so that his family and those around him uh, would not have to do without. Uh, and maybe he was working so hard and the job that he committed to and the high paying job that he was seeking after uh, committed all of his time. And what was more was that he was not able to enjoy it, but rather those around him was the ones that were enjoying it. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe this gentleman died, and a really, truly a complete stranger took over his estate and was therefore enjoying it, because this man maybe had no family left. We don't know. This is all, again, uh, looking outside the text and just applying it to your life and mine. Maybe this gentleman here was given everything under the sun, uh, but yet in his life, he had worked so hard for it, he was so consumed by trying to, trying to get all the material in his life that by the time that he reached the point in his life for him able to enjoy it, his body was so worn down 
that others in his life, maybe his wife, his children, or his grandchildren, were the ones that were enjoying it. And he was left having uh, medical issues and countless issues in life. And so, if you haven't yet marked the similarity there, we, we often see this to be in the case in our life, especially as American Christians. You know, American Christians really do hammer the philosophy that we ought to work hard and we ought to put the time in and we ought to, uh, if we have to do overtime, if you have to work 80 hours a week or 100 hours a week, and I know those are silly numbers, but I've seen some men work 80 plus hours a week. Uh, if that that's what you, it takes to provide the lifestyle that you want, then that's worthy of the effort. And again, as I said, we're not talking bad about a hard work ethic. We're not talking bad about securing a good finances and good lifestyle for your family. But the Bible does say that if you are so focused on working hard, and if you're so focused on trying to amass this lifestyle, that you have neglected what is truly important, and that's those around you, the Bible says that this is an evil disease. And in fact, even in the New Testament, Christ calls this pretty much the nail on its head. He, he brings it up and he says, you know, the money, I know so many people confuse this, he, he never said the money is the root of all evil. What he said was rather the love of money was the root of all evil. I know a lot of people desire to be, especially growing up, uh, those that you know a lot of young kids in high school and college when they're trying to figure out what they want to do in life, uh, usually one of the most attractive things is, well, well what makes the most money? And they see the doctors, and then they see the lawyers, and they see the judges, and the uh, CEOs, and, and they say, no, those people are making six figures and, and up, and, and that's what we want to do. But then they see that it takes 8 to 12 years, sometimes 16 years, and even longer than that. And uh, if you've ever met a doctor, you know, these guys work countless hours a week, and they're always on call, and they're always having to do stuff. It's a very stressful environment. I think that those folks, and especially where, when I worked in a, a place called Allison Transmissions while I was in Bible college, I was working around a lot of guys, and uh, you know it was it's kind of one of the remnants of the 50s and 60s of the of the great industrial new you know the new industrial area uh, in the Midwest really where factories were coming up and GMC was just building factories like McDonald's on corners and everybody from around the surrounding states were just flocking to these car factories and automobile factories and really it, it provided a good job. You know, the husband can work one job and the wife to stay at home and uh, you, you had the Saturdays and Sundays off and you, you, you pretty much were given a pension and everything else under the sun. But a lot of these guys that I've met now that are much, much older, they were in their 60s and 70s, uh, really had you know double knee replacements. Some guys were putting rods up their spines. Other guys were really just you know trying to repair their body from a life of so much hard work. And again, Psalm is not critiquing the man for his wealth, but if you find yourself in a lifestyle where or maybe a pursuit of lifestyle where you are the one that's doing all the work and you are taxing your life at the expense of maybe the possibility of acquiring it down the road. You're not guaranteed tomorrow, my friend. And Solomon says that this pursuit, this greed, is an evil disease, the Bible says. We need to make sure that, really, we're not focused on what we can achieve in life, but rather what God's purpose in life is for us. You know, may have God does call you to a place as a doctor or something where it requires a, a many hours of your life. But, but I think for many of us, we neglect, we try to obtain those things in our life, especially in Christmas. We work overtime, we try to get all the things we can, we put everything on credit, and we, we're going to work overtime next year to pay it off, just for these fleeting temporary moments of enjoyment. But the Bible says we ought not to, we ought not to labor for something in the future, but rather to enjoy life's blessings now and today, something that we talked a little bit about last Sunday night. In fact, I remember reading one commentary here, and I have it written down, where he was writing, and he said, you know what Solomon was saying to us? It was saying that we should enjoy the blessings of God now and thank Him for all of them. Don't plan to live. Start living now. Be satisfied with what He gives you and use it all for His glory. I thought that was really neat, that phrase. Don't plan to live. Start living today. You know, a lot of us do plan to live. In fact, uh, we have family over this evening, and they were we were planning on vacations next year. 
But the truth be told, we're not guaranteed next year. In fact, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we should not neglect today and tomorrow's blessings. We should not neglect the opportunities for today and planning a good time or a vacation or an enjoyable moment six, eight months, years down the road. So we need to start enjoying life today instead of trying to plan to live for tomorrow. So many people are so depressed and, and so burdened physically and spiritually and mentally for the, for the uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel where my dear friend, if you are a, a, safe, or a safe Christian today, a believer in Christ, you have that light dwelling within you and you can have, as we were talking about this morning, that spirit of joy given to you today. And the Bible continues on for the sake of time. Let's go ahead and continue on here. The Bible mentions something else secondly, and that is and that is just the bare necessities of life. Just the bare necessities of life. You know, I uh, took this in here, and uh, really, I don't know if you've ever seen Disney, but uh, in Disney there was a, a old movie, one of my favorite movies, called The Jungle Book, and there was this little old man called Mowgli, and uh, he was with Bear, and that was the song that that was a song, that, a quite catchy song, you know, just the bare necessities, absolute necessities, and that's one of the things that Solomon was talking about in verse three down to verse nine was that we are really fighting for just the bare necessities of life. Read with me there in verse 3 down to verse 9 again. If a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, also that have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. Talking about the Solomon was talking about this man that we just talked about. Uh, it would be better for him not to be born at all than try to live a life full of labor and never become to enjoy it. And, that, and that's an extreme statement. But we understood what he was saying just a few moments ago. Now, now in verse 4. For he cometh in, in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything that this hath more rest than the other. Yea, though he live a thousand years, twice told, he hath seen no good, and do not all go one place. All the labor of man, here in verse 7, really where we start, all the labor of man is for his mouth, the bare necessities, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? And better is the sight of the eye than the wondering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. That verse 7 really hits it on, on, on the thought there. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. And if you really stop and think about it, if you're a person that is working, if you're a person that is in school and learning the applications of life wherever you find yourself in life, truly that, that is what we do each and every day, especially when you're out on your own. <laughs> we are working to be fed and to have water provided for us to cover our necessities for today and for it to be guaranteed tomorrow. If I did not work, if I resigned from the ministry of pastor, if I did not want to uh, work in the area that God has given me, then what will I risk? I will risk the provision of food. I will risk the provision of water. I will risk the provision of housing for not only myself, but for my family. And so when we boil it down to the essence, really what you and I fight for and work for and labor for is for food and water and clothing on our back and, and, and necessities provided to us in our body and the house over, and the roof over our head, so to speak. And the Bible says that that is all of our labor. Now the rest of it is great comforts and wants, but if we get down to it, we work so that we can provide for our necessities. If we didn't have to work and everything was handed to you and I, I don't think uh, many of us would work. <laughs> and uh, that would be the luxury of, of being a child or a teenager, perhaps. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to work. And I know I say, well, we got chores. Well, you're going to find out real soon that uh, maybe some of the adults here listening are shaking their head. I think I'd rather do chores around the house than work any day of the week. That, that, that sounds so much more pleasing and beneficial. And then that's true. What we find here is, is that we need to 
focused not really so much on the wants, but we do really work for just the bare necessities of our life. And what then what one commentator is saying is this, that it is better to have little and really enjoy it than to dream about much and never attain it. It's better to enjoy the things that we have now than to dream about what we don't have and never attain it. Truth be told is we're not guaranteed that uh, we're going to be rich and wealthy and famous, each and every one of us. A lot of people die poor. A lot of people, as they get older, become uh, more tight financially and preserve more. That, this is usually just the fact of life, the, trival, tri, the trivialities of life. And so a good Bible lesson for us today, and what God is trying to talk about, just some good wisdom, is to enjoy what you have for today. Because we can have a life full of joy. We can have a life full of happiness. I was telling my church family this morning that happiness is, depends on what happens in your life and mine. And we can teach ourselves and really uh, learn a very spiritual state, as, as Paul said in Philippians, learn to be content wherewith God puts us. And that's what a spirit of joy is. Learning to be content wherever God puts us. If God puts me in a... Uh, uh, $500,000 house in, in Hawaii 50 years down the road, I won't complain a bit. But if God sees fit to put me in a little shack or put me in a nursing home, I, I don't know what life has for me. Maybe the Lord will call us back in 10 years. I don't know. Then that then that will be fine. If, if I have learned to be spiritually mature and learned to have that true spirit of joy, I'll be like Paul and say, I will be content. I will be Comfortable, I will find enjoyment wherever God has put me. And that takes a strong Christian today. And I pray for him. If you don't, if you don't think you have that, that'd be a good thing to pray for. And especially what COVID in 2020 has taught us that sometimes the luxuries of life, the entertainment of life, is not always guaranteed for us on a day by day circumstance. Read with me last, and we'll wrap up here. Really, the last point that we're talking about is. Knowledge isn't always the answer. Knowledge is not always the answer. I learned this rather, rather, uh, quite quickly or literally when we were looking at X-rays of Alina when she was in the womb, and we got to see a lot of ultrasounds and a lot of things. But really, the ultrasound gave me knowledge, but it didn't give me answers. It didn't tell me whether Alina had blue eyes or brown eyes. It didn't tell me whether Alina had uh, any problems in her life. It didn't tell me what type of personality she was going to have. She came with a warning label. <laughs> the knowledge of what the older son had did not always provide answers. When you did x-rays about a broken bone, it doesn't give you answers about how the bone's going to get fixed. It just gives you knowledge. If you were diagnosed with an illness, and they say, hey, this is your charts, this is your blood levels. You have the knowledge of it, but you don't know the answer of when will it go away, what will my side effects be, how will I feel tomorrow. So knowledge isn't always the answer to our problems. And read with me here from verse 10 to 12. Solomon really concludes that with these questions. That which hath been is named already. That's his first statement. Things that already are, are already been planned. And it is known, one of the things, that it is man. And in man, that he cannot contend, he cannot argue with, he cannot go up against him being God that is mightier than he. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, increase the worthlessness, what is man the better? Pursuing all these things of entertainment. And for who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life, talking about one who just pursues life and not God, which he spendeth as a shadow there, not having the light dwell with them. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? And that's really the, one of the most important questions for your life and mine tonight, friend. Who can tell a man or a person? Who can tell you? Who can tell me what shall be after us when the life is over? When the sun goes down in our life and the sunset hours of our life, who can tell us what will be after the, our life is over? And if you're just a beginning Christian, if you're a labor Christian, if you are somewhere in between, if you don't even know yet, the Bible is our answer there, my friend. The Bible says that there will come a day that whether it be natural causes, whether the Lord calls us home, there is going to come a day when this life is over. 
and all the hard work that we put in or maybe the luxuries that we're trying to enjoy when all of it is going to go away. And what will only ever matter is whether you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life. Not how well you did, not what you gave to charities, not whether you were in church all your life or you never even once stepped into a building, but whether you accepted Jesus Christ into your life tonight or not. That's the question. That's the true meaning of our life. To quite simply know that we are a sinner. We've all done wrong. We've all continued to do wrong, and we're probably going to do wrong tomorrow. And that's just a simple understanding of who we are. And because of our sins, the Bible says that that separated us from God. And without reconciliation, without uh, accepting His gift through that birth of Jesus Christ, as we're learning what Christmas is about in the next coming weeks, we will remain a person who never asked God's gift to be loaned into us, a person who never accepted God's gift into our life, salvation. And because of that, God doesn't hate us. God doesn't want to smite us. God doesn't uh, find us ugly. He, he loves us so much so that Jesus died for you and I tonight. But if we don't accept that, the Bible says then we're going to go to a place called hell. And there's a lot of things about hell, and we don't try, quite know all the answers about hell. You know, as we say, knowledge is not an answer. But truthfully, probably one of the most scariest, one of the most harshest realities about hell is that it's an eternal separation of God and you and I, if we never ask God into our life. Not the pain or the suffering or all that stuff that's in there, but the eternal separation of God and you and I. Even people who don't even know about God has God around them in their life today in this world. He's all around us. But if you've asked Jesus to come into your life today, my friend, if you haven't yet, I encourage you to do so. The Bible says all we need to have is a believing heart, knowing that we are a sinner, knowing that Jesus Christ came down and died for you and I today. And understanding that he died on Calvary for your sin and mine. He rose three days later as our Savior. And the Bible says if we asked him, our Savior, to come into our life and be our Savior as well, then God will be just and faithful to forgive us. And when that day comes, when the sunset of our life is approached, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you didn't do. It doesn't matter what you tried to do. It all matters whether you accept the Jesus Christ in your life. And I pray that you have. Looking forward to what you guys will be talking about tonight in our fireplace conversations. And looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Maybe this Wednesday, dear Lord willing, as we continue our study in the book of Job. God bless and God be with you. Amen.